Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Dan Friedel reports on new guidelines surrounding childhood obesity. Ashley Thompson and John Russell have a story on the causes of long COVID. Later, we present the next part in our American History series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, a new recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics says. Doctors should treat childhood obesity aggressively. Obesity is a word used to describe severely overweight people. In the past, many doctors thought children would grow out of bad eating habits. They used the method of wait and see to decide what to do, but the new guidelines say obese children. Should undergo operations or take medications to reduce their weight. Both actions, the doctors' group said, should reduce the amount of food children can eat. The problem of being overweight affects over 14 million American children. Doctors say carrying extra weight often results in lifelong health problems. Children can develop high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression. The new guidelines recommend weight loss drugs for children as young as 12, and operations or surgery starting at 13. Ioma Anelli is a doctor who co-wrote the report containing the new guidelines. Anelli disagrees with the old guidelines. She said, "Waiting doesn't work." She said doctors usually see a continuation of weight gain, and the likelihood that children will have obesity in adulthood. Anelli is the director of the Center for Healthy Weight and Nutrition at a hospital in Columbus, Ohio. She said the drugs or surgery should go along with life changes. That means children need help choosing better foods. And finding ways to exercise more. Dr. Sandra Hasink was the other doctor who wrote the report. She works for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and is the medical director for the Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight. Hasink said the report offers pediatricians a different way to think about obesity. In the past, she said. Doctors sometimes thought of obesity as a personal problem or failure. Children are considered obese if their body mass index, or BMI, is higher than 95 percent of children of the same age. BMI is a measure of body size based on a person's height and weight. She said the weight loss tools described in the report should be thought of in the same way as other treatments for health problems. She compared it to prescribing an inhaler for someone who has asthma. Asthma is a medical condition that causes people to have trouble breathing. An inhaler supplies medicine that opens a person's lungs. In the same way. The drugs the doctors talk about in their guidelines help a person to eat less food, which will help them lose weight. Semaglutide is the drug described in the report. It started as a diabetes treatment, but a version of semaglutide called Wegovy recently received approval as an obesity treatment for children 12 and older. The New England Journal of Medicine reported that teenagers have used the drug, and reduced their BMI by an average of 16 percent. Dr. Claudia Fox 
is a weight management doctor at the University of Minnesota. When Wigovi received approval in late December, she started prescribing it to teenagers. Fox said the drug helps her patients have a possibility of even having an almost normal body mass index. She called the results a whole different level of improvement compared to other treatments. Justin Ryder is a doctor who researches obesity for a children's hospital in Chicago. He said, the drug helps the brain and the stomach communicate. And he said, helps you feel more full than you would be without it. While children are losing weight because of the drug, it is hard to get. There are two reasons. There is a production shortage, and more doctors are offering it to their patients. Semaglutide is now popular because people on social media have lost weight using it. Some doctors, however, worry that not every overweight child is a good candidate for the drug. Dr. Robert Lustig studies children's health at the University of California in San Francisco. He said he wants to be sure people do not prescribe the medication willy-nilly. Dr. Stephanie Byrne is at the Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Byrne said she still wants to see more research on how semaglutide affects many different children. But, she said, she is glad pediatricians are starting to think differently about obesity. I definitely think this is a realization that diet and exercise is not going to do it for a number of teens who are struggling with this, she said. I'm Dan Friedel. A British historian, an Italian archaeologist, and an American teacher all have something in common. The three women are credited with describing and naming the condition known as long COVID in early 2020. Almost three years into the pandemic, scientists are still trying to figure out why some people get long COVID and why a small percentage, including the three women, have lasting symptoms. Rachel Pope, the historian, is from the British city of Liverpool. She posted on Twitter about her symptoms in late March 2020, after a coronavirus infection. A few months later, in Italy, Elisa Perigo tweeted about her sickness also, and used the term long COVID in the post. And that same year, Amy Watson of Portland, Oregon, founded a Facebook support group for people like her who were suffering from long COVID. She identified them as long haulers, a term used in the trucking industry. The name stuck. Millions of people worldwide report having long COVID. The symptoms include lung damage, difficulty thinking and remembering, extreme tiredness, and other problems. Evidence suggests most people get better within a year. But recent data show that long COVID has played a part in more than 3,500 U.S. deaths. Many studies suggest that women are more likely than men to develop long COVID. There could be biological reasons. Women's immune systems generally have stronger reactions to viruses, bacteria, and other germs, said Sabra Klein, an immune system expert at Johns Hopkins University. Women are also much more likely than men to have autoimmune diseases, where the body mistakenly attacks its own healthy tissue. Some scientists believe long COVID can result from an autoimmune response caused by the virus. 
Women's bodies are also more likely to have more fat tissue. New research suggests the coronavirus may hide in fat after infection. Scientists also are studying whether women's changing hormone levels may increase the risks. Yet there are other possible issues at work. Women are more likely than men to seek health care, Klein said. She added that often women are more sensitive to changes in their bodies. I don't think we should ignore that, she said, adding that biology and behavior are probably both at play. Several studies suggest the Epstein-Barr virus could play a part in some cases of long COVID. Epstein-Barr is a very common virus. It has infected an estimated 90% of the U.S. population. The virus's effects can differ greatly among those infected. Some patients might develop the disease mononucleosis, for example. Others, however, may not be sickened at all by an Epstein-Barr infection. Inflammation caused by coronavirus infection can activate or reactivate some viruses in the body, said Dr. Timothy Henrich. He is an expert with the University of California, San Francisco. Henrich is among researchers who have found immune system markers pointing to Epstein-Barr reactivation in the blood of long COVID patients. Not all long COVID patients have these markers, but it's possible that Epstein-Barr is causing symptoms in those who do, although scientists say more study is needed. Obesity is a risk factor for severe COVID-19 infections, and scientists are trying to understand why. Stanford University researchers are among those who have found evidence that the coronavirus can infect fat cells. In a recent study, they found the virus and signs of inflammation in fat tissue taken from people who had died from COVID-19. Lab tests showed that the virus can reproduce in fat tissue. That raises the possibility that fat tissue could serve as a storage area, possibly fueling long COVID. Dr. Lawrence Purpura is an infectious disease expert at Columbia University in New York. He said about patients with long COVID, The majority of patients will eventually recover. It's important for people to know that. Still, the women who helped the world recognize the condition of long COVID remain concerned about recovery. Perigo developed heart, lung, and other problems, and remains seriously sick. The 44-year-old says she knows that scientists have learned a lot in a short time. But there is a gap, she said, between long COVID research and medical care. Watson, who is 59, says she has never had any kind of recovery. She experiences severe headaches, digestive trouble, and nerve and foot problems. Recently, she developed anemia. She wishes the medical community had a more organized process for treating long COVID. Doctors say not knowing the underlying cause or causes makes that difficult. I just want my life back, Watson said. And it's not looking like that's all that possible. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm John Russell. You just heard John Russell and Ashley Thompson present this week's Health and Lifestyle Report. John is here to talk more about the story. Welcome back, John. Thanks, Dan. I wanted to ask you about a word mentioned in the story, gap. Elisa Perigo said she believes there is a gap between long COVID research and medical care. 
Could you talk a bit more about the term? Sure. Gap is a noun. A gap is a missing part, a space between two things, or a difference between two things. By saying there is a gap between long COVID research and medical care, Perigo meant there is something missing between research on the one hand and medical care on the other. What is missing? It could be communication, information, knowledge, and so on. Interesting. Thanks for answering my questions, John. You're welcome. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. President Abraham Lincoln led the Union of Northern States in four years of civil war against the Southern Confederacy. But he did not live to see the end of the war. He did not live to see the nation reunited. He was assassinated in April of 1865. Shep O'Neill and Morris Joyce tell what happened after Lincoln died. Almost immediately, officials began planning details of the president's funeral. They asked Mrs. Lincoln where she wanted her husband buried. At first, she said Chicago. That was where the Lincolns were going to live after they left the White House. Then she said the Capitol building in Washington. A tomb had been built there for America's first president, George Washington, but it had never been used. Finally, she remembered a country cemetery they had visited. At the time, her husband had said, When I am gone, lay my remains in some quiet place like this. So Mrs. Lincoln decided that the president's final resting place would be in the quiet, beautiful Oak Ridge Cemetery outside their hometown of Springfield, Illinois. For several days after Lincoln's assassination, his body lay in the East Room of the White House. The room was open to the public all day. Next, the body was taken to the Capitol building. Again, the public could come to say goodbye. Then the body was put on a special train for the trip back to Illinois. Four years earlier, President-elect Lincoln had traveled by train from Illinois to Washington. He stopped to make speeches in cities along the way. Now, on this sad return trip, the train stopped at those same cities. Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, Indianapolis, Chicago. In every town, people lined the railroad. They stood silently with tears in their eyes as the train moved slowly past. Farmers working in the fields saw the train and dropped to their knees in prayer. For the wise man who had led the Union through four years of bloody civil war Father Abraham was dead. Churches throughout the country held memorial services. Ministers told their people that God had taken Lincoln because the president had completed the job God had given him. He had brought peace to the Union and freedom to all men. The final service was at the cemetery outside Springfield. It ended with the words from Lincoln's second inaugural speech. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. Let us heal the nation's wounds. Let us do all possible to get and keep a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. 
While the nation mourned Lincoln's death, federal officials investigated his assassination. The man who had shot Lincoln in Ford's theater was an actor, John Wilkes Booth. He had fled the theater after the murder. The government offered a reward of one hundred thousand dollars to anyone who captured Booth and his helpers. The investigation produced the names of several people who were friends of Booth. One was John Surratt. Like Booth, he supported the Southern Confederacy during the Civil War. Another was David Harold, a young man who worked in a store in Washington. Others were George Atzerodt, Louis Payne, Sam Arnold, and Michael O'Loughlin. Most of these men had stayed at a house owned by John Surratt's mother, Mary. One by one, in the days following Lincoln's death, these people were arrested. Anyone else who might have had a part in the plot was seized. Soon, hundreds of suspects were being held in jails in and around Washington. At the end of a week. Only two of the plotters were still free: David Harold and John Wilkes Booth. Booth broke his leg when he jumped from the presidential box to the stage at Ford's Theater. A few hours later, he and Harold stopped at the home of a Dr. Samuel Mudd. They reportedly gave the doctor false names. They asked him to fix Booth's broken leg. Doctor Mudd agreed, and he let the two men sleep at his home. Federal troops chasing the assassins arrested the doctor. They accused him of being part of the plot. John Wilkes Booth and David Harold ran and hid for six days. They crossed the Potomac River from Maryland into Virginia. Finally, twelve days after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, soldiers found the two men. They were hiding in a tobacco barn near the town of Port Royal. Harold agreed to surrender. He came out of the barn with his hands in the air. He shouted again and again that he was innocent. Booth refused to come out. The soldiers set fire to the barn. The fire forced Booth to move close to the door. The soldiers could see him now. He was aiming a gun at them. The soldiers had been ordered to capture Booth alive. But one of them raised his gun and shot Booth in the neck. The actor fell. Some of the soldiers ran to the burning barn and pulled him out. They carried him to a nearby house. He died two hours later. John Wilkes Booth carried a notebook. He wrote in it every day. On the day Lincoln was killed, he wrote, "For six months we had worked to kidnap Lincoln, but with the Confederacy being almost lost, something decisive and great must be done." I struck boldly. Booth described how and why he had shot the president. Our country, Booth wrote. Owed all her troubles to him, and God simply made me the instrument of his punishment. Booth's body was returned to Washington. Men who knew him confirmed that it was the body of John Wilkes Booth. The body was buried under the stone floor of the Washington prison. A few years later. 
his family received permission to move the body to a cemetery in the city of Baltimore. Evidence showed that only a few people were actually involved in the plot against the president. Most had agreed to work with Booth because they believed he planned to kidnap Lincoln, not kill him. Of the hundreds of persons arrested, only eight were brought to trial. The Secretary of War decided that they would be tried by a military court. He argued that Lincoln had been commander-in-chief of all military forces and had been murdered during wartime. The trial began almost two months after the assassination. The prisoners seemed in poor condition. All wore heavy chains on their arms and legs, and the men had been forced to wear thick cloths over their heads. Officials said the cloths were necessary to prevent them from talking to each other. The Secretary of War announced that the prisoners could not meet privately with their defense lawyers. They could meet only in the courtroom. Guards could hear everything they said. One of the defense lawyers recognized that the job was hopeless. He said the trial was a contest between the defense lawyers and the whole United States. There was no question, he said, what the military court's decision would be. The government tried to prove that Lincoln's assassination was a Confederate plot. Witnesses told how Confederate supporters reportedly planned to cause trouble in the North. But none could prove that Confederate President Jefferson Davis or any other Southern leader, played a part in Booth's plot to kill Lincoln. Four hundred witnesses appeared. Many of the important ones had been arrested as suspects. They agreed to give evidence if the government dropped the charges against them. For six weeks, the court heard evidence against the eight prisoners. The prisoners themselves could say nothing. They could only listen. In late June 1865, the trial of Abraham Lincoln's assassins ended. The military officers serving as judges met secretly for two days. Then they announced their decision. All eight prisoners were found guilty. One received a prison sentence of six years. Three were sentenced to life in prison. Four were sentenced to die. Defense lawyers appealed for mercy. The appeal was rejected. On July 7th, David Herald, Louis Payne, George Atzerott, and Mary Surratt were hanged for the murder of Abraham Lincoln. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 